All right. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. We're always excited when we get a chance to connect for our Hearts in the Ice event. Uh, we've got a great group of classrooms who are starting to tune in with us from across North America. Uh, so a huge shout out to our YouTube classrooms uh, who are joining us. Don't forget you can get in on the action. Use the chat sidebar, let us know where you're watching from, send in some questions, and we'll make sure uh, that we work those in. So we're really excited to have uh, Cinema Sorby and her expedition partner, Hilda Strom. They've been in Svalbard for several months now. They're living in a remote trapper's cabin uh, with the name of Bumsibu. In total, they're gonna spend nine months there becoming the first woman to overwinter uh, solo. Along the way, they've been doing all kinds of citizen science projects. They'll tell us about some of those today. We've been connecting them with them for live events each month, learning about what they've been up to and all kinds of different things, ranging from climate change to technology. And we're really excited uh, for today's event. So Hilda and Seneva, I know you are in the midst of a crazy storm right now. We're so glad to have you connecting with technology and we're excited to get to know you a little better today. Yeah, thank you, Joe. We're super happy to be here because it is raging outside. Um, it's really hard to walk. Um, I think I'm, I need to eat some more Christmas cookies or something so that I don't blow away because um, it's that strong outside. That reminds me, I forgot to play the little video off the top. You guys sent us a little video clip. So students, you're getting an idea of just the kind of weather that uh, they're dealing with right now. So give me a second to share my screen and let's take a look uh, at the little greeting from Hilda and Sinova uh, in Svalbard. So here we go, my screen should be sharing. I'm gonna take this video full screen and let's see some of that power. I'm going to come back from that screen share. You can get an idea of just the power of the wind there. It was hard to hear them. Um, and then what they were showing us was that mission link that was allowing them to connect with us from such a remote location. So Hilda and Seneva, I'll let you take over for a little bit. Tell us a little bit about yourselves and what you've been up to. Okay. Um, thanks. And thank you, everybody, for joining the call today. I, um, from across Canada, I take it. We are um, on day 80 of our stay here at the Bumsabu this 20 square meter trapper's cabin and there's you know nothing but 360 degrees of mountains ice and snow um, 140 kilometers away from the nearest town so we feel pretty vulnerable where we are right now we um we do have that box that uh, you saw in the video it's a pelican case it's watertight it's made by tails um, a company t-h-a-l-e-s and it's watertight, so we can leave it outside. So far, it's, it's um, been okay in minus 17, minus 20, roughly. Um, and that's got wires from it, and those wires get fed through a little hole that's there sort of for ventilation for the, for the hut. And then we've got that inside, and we're connecting to you with the phone right now. It's absolutely crazy that we can do this. It's an Iridium satellite system that enables us to do it. Um, and uh, we, are, we are the first people, the first civil, civilians, actually, to use this box. It's um, primarily designed for the maritime industry and the military. So it's pretty cool, and it works well. Um, and we also have uh, a phone. Look, if this phone doesn't work with that box, we've also got an Iridium Extreme satellite phone. And uh, Iridium is probably one of the biggest... Um, you know, manufacturers or uh, suppliers of satellite uh, data, which is pretty amazing. So we, that's what we do. We're operating, uh, we're talking to you via a satellite right now, uh, not like a phone line or not via the internet. So um, it's pretty amazing. And, and then also just a couple of things that we have here that, that make it really uh, cool for us to be remote citizen scientists is uh, we have a drone, an infrared drone, and Eric will talk about that. We're using something um, from Indro Robotics, and this infrared sensor enables us to take pictures in the dark because we're in 24 hours of darkness right now. So our technology and our equipment has to be 
bomb proof. It's got to withstand cold and wind and dark and all sorts of abuse, actually, for us as well when we're out because it's a pretty rough area. All right. Well, okay. Well, it definitely looks rough from that video that uh, you sent. So it's obviously some pretty amazing technology that can hold up through that kind of abuse. Uh, Hilton Cinema, we would love to know a little bit about what life is like living in a small trapper's cabin. Well, that hissing sound means we're about to lose them. So we're going to lose them for a minute, uh, and then they're going to come back to us. So uh, unfortunately, there is a really wild storm going on right now. That storm can cause a lot of cloud coverage, which can interfere uh, with what we're up to. So we're going to give them just a moment uh, to see if they can pop back in. If we don't see them in about a minute, I'm going to jump to the second part of our call, and we're going to meet Eric, who's uh, hanging out with us today. So I'm going to give them maybe 60 seconds to come back in uh, and join us. And then if that's not successful, we'll jump into part two uh, of our call, and then we'll have Hilda and Cinema tell us a little bit about life at Bumsabu uh, shortly. So I do want to give a quick shout out. I can see there's some classrooms tuning in on YouTube. Use the chat sidebar, say hello, let us know where you're watching from. Uh, give a shout out. We've got some grade sixes in Guelph, Ontario with Mrs. Hamilton hanging out with us. So great to see you joining in. Uh, send us in some questions via the chat sidebar. Okay. All right, Eric, I'm going to keep an eye out for them to come back in, but I think you and I should take over uh, for a little bit. So boys and girls, we're really excited. Today's event is all about technology. So Hilda and Cineva, we're, we're showing you the mission control link that they're able to use to connect from somewhere so far north. Uh, today, we get to have Eric uh, Sauchuk joining us today. He's a geomatics instructor at the British Columbia Institute of Technology, and he plays with some pretty cool tech. He uses drones to create 3D models of places uh, like Antarctica to gather data to show just how things are changing uh, over time. So Eric, it's so awesome to have you joining us live today. We're looking forward to get to know you a little bit better and learn about some of the tech you're using in the polar regions. Great to be here, Joe. Thank you very much for, for having me. This is really exciting. Um, I, I myself have a couple of 13-year-old uh, girls who are all into technology. So I have a question for you guys out there. Um, who likes drones? Yeah, right on. This is awesome. Who doesn't like drones, right? That's the better question. So I love drones because it allows me to fulfill my desire to fly. So I'm now a drone pilot flying this little robot um, all over the place. Um, and so one of the great things about this technology is that it allows me to travel and go to really cool places to see how it works. Well, I see uh, Sinovan and Hilda are, I think are back online. Yeah, I think so. We're back online. All right. Okay. So Hilda and Sinovan, I just introduced Eric and he was just starting to share a little bit about uh, the work he's doing with drones. So if you're up for it, why don't we let Eric continue for a little bit and then we can come back to you guys and talk a little bit about um, life at Bumsabu before we hit some questions. Okay, that sounds great, thanks. All right. Cool, so looking at that video, I, I grew up in Winnipeg and that looks exactly like, like Winnipeg was when I lived there. So it's very different from Vancouver. Vancouver has a pretty, pretty, uh, pretty nice day today. So I'm lucky to be inside. Um, one of the great thing about flying drones is that it's, um, you can't fly it in those conditions. So you, you only end up flying it in really calm, nice weather. So it's, you know, if, if you don't like being outside in the snow, if you don't like being outside in the rain, um, then a career in drones is something you could consider because we only fly when the weather is nice, which is really cool. Um, and so I have a little, uh, one of my little guys here you, you guys have probably seen one of these, uh, maybe in Best Buy or somewhere online. It's a, it's a little DJI Mavic. Um, it's very, very similar to the drone that Hilda and Cinova are flying uh, up in Svalbard uh, when, of course, the weather is nice. So it's got a little um, camera on it. This one has a, just a regular color camera, but their, their drone has an extra camera on it uh, that's thermal, so they can see heat. So they can see things even when it's pitch dark outside. Um, so I guess maybe the question you guys might have is, well, what are they looking at up, the, up there? Um, so one of the things that you might think of that they are looking for out there is polar bears or wildlife in general. 
uh, it's really hard to see a polar bear when it's super dark outside and you want to know that they're there because of course it could be quite dangerous to run into a polar bear um, and so they're using uh, technology of, I've got other examples of little cameras here so this is a thermal camera this will allow you to see uh, infrared into into the night see heat <clears throat> and I've also got this kind of strange looking camera um, that has not just one lens but five lenses on it and this allows you to see in different spectrums of color so you can see red separately from green from blue from infrared and color all combined so these are different sensors that we can attach to drones to help us capture data that we wouldn't normally be able to see with our own eyes. Um, the, the controlling of the drone happens with something you guys are all very familiar with. See this big, big iPad? <laughs> so this iPad's attached to the controller. So this allows me to control the drone with the sticks. This allows me to see what the drone is seeing through the camera. And so that I can guide it, I can have information about how high it is, how fast it's going, and, and, and keep it under control. So this is the control unit. Now, <clears throat> I guess the next question you might have is what, what, what kind of data or what kind of information can you capture with a drone? So you might think that it takes pictures and it takes videos and that's, that's what it's used for. And you're, you're exactly right. The question is then, what would we do with that information? What could we do with that data? So I just wanna share with you here a little bit um, some data that I captured while I was in Norway. So I was actually on the ship that dropped off uh, Hilda and Sinova in Svalbard and, uh, and then we sort of waved goodbye and then we sailed away and they, they're, they're still up there. So while I was up there, I captured a bit of data. So I'll just switch over to my other screen here and hopefully you guys can see that. Give me a thumbs up if you can see the map. Cool, great. So what we're looking at here, it's kind of hard to tell right now what this is. Whoops. Let's put that back into its proper configuration. So what we're looking at here is actually the surface of a glacier. There we go. In 3D. Right? So how I took these pictures or how I made this, this 3D model is I flew the drone in a programmed pattern. How many of you guys like computer programming or playing video games? Right on. So you guys are all sold on this stuff anyway. Um, so this is basically what drones are like. It's just programming a little robot to collect data for you. And then you can do some really useful things with it, uh, even related to climate change. So you see these little sticks up here, now uh, the blue squares right there. These are all pictures that the drone uh, took while it was flying back and forth in a pre-programmed pattern. And the pictures themselves are no different than the pictures you guys take with your cell phones or with your cameras. They just look like this, except they're taken from above looking directly down. The cool thing is if you take these photos in a certain way that they overlap by 80%, so we're not just taking photos side by side, but there's the same information in adjacent photos, the software does this magical thing of stitching them together and creating this 3D model of the front of a glacier. So here's kind of like what the glacier would look like looking straight on and we can rotate it looking from the top and we can zoom in there. There's lots of detail in there. It's a very uh, dynamic glacial surface. So you could probably imagine that it's quite important for us to be able to capture this data um, in order to monitor how it's changing over time. So we can make measurements on this. We can actually measure distance, we can measure volume, um, and we can come back to this glacier and measure it again at a different point in time to try and get an, a sense of how it's changing, which is really some of the critical information around climate change and climate change research. Now, keep it, so take a look at this image and keep in mind what you're seeing. Um, what we've got here on the bottom, where my mouse is right here, this is all water. This is all glacial water melting from the glacier. This is all the sediment and rock that's underneath the glacier. And up here, of course, we have the ice. Okay, keep that in mind. I'm going to switch the view here to something that's gonna look quite different. Okay, take a second or two. Three, two, one, there it is. 
All right, so now what we're looking at, it looks pretty cool, eh? I like the colors. Um, so now we're looking at the exact same thing. We're looking at the glacier from the exact same point of view as the previous one. And so down here, this purple over here is the water. All of this yellowish orangey stuff is the sediment and the rock. And the rest of it up here is the ice. This is a heat image, a thermal image of a glacier. So this is showing us how much heat is being given off by the ice, by the sediment, and by the meltwater. And this is the kind of information that we can capture in addition to color imagery. And when it's pure darkness outside, like it is for Hilda and Cinova right now, they can't take any color photos because they would just all be black. Um, so the only photos they can really collect are the color thermal ones that I'm showing here. And this is also a very cool 3D model of uh, a glacier. Have you guys ever seen anything like this? Me neither, first time for me too. So I think it's pretty cool. All right. Um, now, Joe, I do have a, a very short video clip of my trip down to Antarctica. Should I go ahead and throw that on? Yeah, go for it. it looks like Hilda and Cinema uh, ducked out again. So let's do it. I think that'd be cool to see uh, you in action. They're coming and going. All right, let me, let me show you this. You guys, you guys will like this, I promise. Who likes penguins? How come you don't, there's one guy, there you go. All right, I'm sure, because everybody loves penguins. Check this out. So this is the drone that I was flying in Antarctica. And look at these guys, they're just, they're so curious. They just want to check out this strange thing um, that flies and and you know they're probably a little bit jealous because they can't um so they probably want to jump on and, and and go for a ride i think that'd be pretty cool but there we go so that's a short little clip of the and then i'll show you another one here this guy this guy got really curious can you guys see that yeah so he was right in there nipping at it, making sure that everything is mounted correctly. So he was he was what I call my uh, quality control officer. And then I'll show you one other little clip here um, of some drone footage. So this is a research station, um, Argentinian research station down in Antarctica. So they they run experiments in stations like this. So very remote, very isolated. Uh, similar to well to where uh, Hilda and Sinova are right now. All right, it looks like some beautiful locations and it looks like some challenging, uh, some challenging locals overseeing some of your work at times. Definitely, yeah. So it, 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 as I said at the beginning, the cool thing about drones is that it's taken me to some very, very interesting places um, and Drone technology encompasses physics, it encompasses math, it encompasses coding and computer science, it, en it encompasses creativity because it allows you to take uh, photos and videos in a very creative way. Even if you like airplanes and, and piloting, uh, it can teach you a lot about how to fly uh, an aircraft. Absolutely, and those 3D maps uh, that you created are, are amazing. I haven't seen anything quite like that. That's pretty pretty amazing. I can see how wildly valuable that is to get a baseline of some glaciers and then see how things are changing over time. Pretty powerful images to use. Yeah, indeed. Exactly. All right. Well, Hilda and Sinova are back with us. So Hilda and Sinova, we just saw, we had a great presentation from Eric. Amazing technology he's using to create uh, these, these maps, the 3D maps, the thermal images. Uh, we'd love to, while we have you, to get a little lowdown on some of your citizen science action and life at uh, Bumsaboo. Yeah, sounds good. And I will uh, promise Eric that we are not flying the drone in this weather. <laughs> good, good. Um, I wish, wish we could. But um, a couple of other really cool things we're doing. Um, for one, right now, since the weather is so bad, we can't, number one, we can't fly the drone. We also can't put our boat in the water because we're frozen in right now. Um, and some of our citizen science involves collecting phytoplankton and water samples. We can't do that. But 
but we are um, able to capture photography of uh, the night sky because it's 24 hours of darkness here. So we're taking time-lapse photography of the aurora, and I have to tell you guys, it is, I mean, he has been living up here for 25 years, and this is my, my first time in the polar night. And to be here in this place with no outside, no traffic, no Netflix, no stores, no other light source, nothing. And just to be in total blackness with these rainbow sky from the aurora showering down on us, it's amazing. So we're doing time-lapse photography for NASA. Um, and we're also, they've asked us to be on call, and we have been since November 25th, every morning starting at 9 a.m. Um, to photograph some rockets that they're hoping to launch from Andrea and from um, from Longyearbyen. And these rockets are going to release a gas. And w when they um, kind of explode up there, uh, we're able to photograph it. They give us, what, uh, you know, exactly what time and the coordinates. And we should be able to see the 4th of July in the sky, a fireworks. And what they're trying to do with that is study the cusp aurora, a type of aurora that only happens up here at around noon, um, like late morning, early noon. So they're calling us rocket citizen scientists. Um, pretty cool stuff. And I'm, I'm going to um, ask Hilda to talk about some other, like, technology that we have up here because we have no running water and no electricity. No, that's right. This uh, hut was built in 1930 as a trapper hut, and they used to trap... Uh, or to hunt belugas, uh, white whales. Now that's not uh, legal anymore. So, and this hut is really old, and it's uh, kind of cold here now. It's it's uh, it's not insulated for for the winter. But uh, we do have a windmill and solar panel. And um, solar panel doesn't work now, obviously, since we don't have any sun. But a windmill is going like crazy outside here now because it's a big storm. So that uh, actually generates quite uh, for us to talk to you guys now. So it's of power. And, um, yeah, we didn't mention that. We ha have outside li lightning, and uh, we have power bears walking around here. So it's a good thing to be able to turn off, turn on the light in order to see outside the door if we have a big polar bear visiting or, 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 or not. Which, which happened, actually, about three weeks ago, just um, maybe two meters from me when I walked outside. Yeah, well, they are here. So we are the visitors, so... Uh, we just have to watch out very carefully now during the dark season and make sure that we are safe. And uh, just uh, very quickly, the last thing that we're doing, uh, and it involves Eric, um, we're using the drone, and I know that uh, Eric's using what we capture from the drones to collaborate with the Scripps Institute of Oceanography and the Norwegian Polar Institute because um, studying people studying under the water, people studying above the water, and then people studying in the sky. So it's it's a in the middle all right so it definitely sounds like busy times at Bumsibu. it sounds like we may lose them they're gonna have to reload and join us but eric i think we should get things rolling uh it's good to hear you're a prairie boy i was born in musiman uh, Saskatchewan. So spent lots of time in the snow and visiting Brandon and Winnipeg. So I'm, I'm used to those kind of areas. So very cool. Yeah, that's me. All right. Well, let's start meeting some live classrooms, YouTube groups. Don't forget to send in your questions via YouTube. We're going to start off. Actually, I'm going to start off. I'm going to introduce Mrs. Holloway's group. So they are grade sevens in Mississauga, Ontario. They are the Climb Act detectives and they are tuning in. They're uh, microphone isn't cooperating with them. So they're going to type their questions to me, but they're here in the event. So I'll keep an eye out for your questions, but let's go to Mrs. Gill's group. They're in Cambridge, Ontario. Some grade five, six students hanging out with us. Let's get that turned on. How are we doing grade five, sixes? If one of the satellites that they're using outside um, at the cabin down uh, in uh, uh, the Arctic areas. If one of these satellites breaks and it's really dark, is it very hard to fix it? All right, bud. We're going to have to save that question just for a moment until they get back in to join with us. So Hilda and Cinema will know all about what they have to do if something uh, goes wrong with 
the unit. But if you have any questions directly for Eric about the drones, uh, we'll start with those ones just because um, we don't have Hilda and Cinema right now to answer questions. Oh, my co-host is joining us too. There Hello. we go. Say hi, Nora. Hi, Nora. All right. So my co-host is joining us. Daycare is out for the day. So let's get to there. There we go. All right. Mrs. Gill, do you guys have a question about the drones? Yes. All right. What are, what are some other uses of a drone in the Arctic? Yeah, awesome question. I was hoping you would ask that. Um, so I, I think one of the coolest um, uses of a drone in the Arctic regions is to measure the weight and size of animals. Um, <clears throat> so for example, seals or polar bears or caribou, um, they're very difficult to measure. Uh, you would have to send a team of four people you'd have to shoot the animal with a tranquilizer dart to make it go to sleep. And then you would have to sort of take a tape measure and measure its length and measure its width and, and its height and all that stuff. The magical thing about drones, is I could just fly the drone over the animal, take a few pictures and process all that data in 3D in about 30 minutes without ever touching the animal. I think that's one of the coolest applications of drones in Arctic regions. All right, that's really cool. That's, uh, you know, some of the most invasive parts of science is when you do have to take the animal out of its habitat or tranquilize it and work with it. So that's pretty amazing that you can use drones uh, to do that. So Hilda Incentiva, I can see you're back and our classroom uh, in Cambridge asked a question for you. They're wondering about the satellite technology. If it goes down uh, and it's dark, is it difficult to get things going again, to get things up and running? Well, um, the satellite, their satellites are always in orbit. Um, like there are 69 sat satellites in orbit, I, I believe, from uh, Iridium that are launched. If uh, everything goes down for us um, and we can't connect with a satellite, we have absolutely zero communication um, with the outside world. So we're really, um, you know, we're 100% um, um, reliant on satellite technology. And that's, that's, uh, there's no other way to, to, to spin that answer. All right, fair enough. No, that makes total sense. Um, I've got a question that was just sent in from uh, our grade sevens in Mississauga. And Eric, they're wondering, is there a way to make a drone tough enough or rugged enough to fly in a storm? Uh, to a degree, yes. Uh, there are drones that are waterproof that are to a certain degree weatherproof. Uh, everything has its limits. Uh, so I think from the winds that we saw in that video today that uh, were Hilda and Sinovar, I don't think there's any drone that would be able to fly in those winds. Uh, but I think up to 40 or 50 kilometers an hour would, would be okay. Some of the tougher, more rugged drones out there, yes. All right. Uh, we're going to visit Mrs. Franz's group now. They are hanging out in Red Deer, Alberta. Some fifth graders hanging out with us. Let's get that microphone turned on. How are we doing, Red Deer? My question is, before they left, <laughs> did they have to prepare their bodies or do any safety drills or do anything before they left? Oh, that's a great question. So until then, some of that, read it. They're wondering if before you left for the Arctic, did you have to do anything to prepare your bodies? Can you repeat that question, Joe? Sorry, we couldn't hear it very well. That's okay. They're wondering if before you left for the Arctic, was there anything you had to do to prepare your bodies or any drills you had to learn? Yeah, um, I'll just start us off on that. It's, um, we had, um, we took two years to prepare for this, for this stay here. It's a logistical, complex um, equation of, of math and, and, and all sorts of things to figure out what you need for nine months uh, when you can't get anything else. Um, so there's that preparation. The physical preparation, uh, both Hilda and I really enjoy staying healthy and strong just for life and for adventures. And um, 
So we didn't do anything very specific, but we wanted to make sure that we started our entire stay here injury-free because there's no doctor. Uh, anything that happens to us, whether it's a cut or a burn or frostbite or anything like that, it's up to us. So we've got a big first aid kit. Um, and in terms of the mental preparation, I'll let Hilda speak a little bit about that. Yeah, we had a Swedish um, coach and also um, an English one. So we, we we stayed in touch with them for uh, almost a year in order to be become more um, to know each other uh, better and for me to to know myself better and to know uh, that so we find out what's our weakest. Um, this link sort of uh, and and also some tools in order to to speak to each other and communicate better so um and and then I have some experience from from this kind of life before, and soon I also have has a lot of winter experience and outdoor experience so we have done quite well uh, but we are maybe not ordinary <laughs> we are we have done this kind of things before and um so yes it's it's a lot of preparation in order to to be here uh, like today now and i'll have to just add um that um we have a lot of safety equipment and a lot of first aid uh, equipment and even though both of us have experience we both do drills, like when we're going outside and we're going to use a snowmobile, we have a little checklist of what we need to take with us. And we, we you know, body, we, we actually do the buddy system where we check each other and make sure that we each have uh, brought what we, what we needed to take. So, like, that's a physical sort of training, too, is just really understanding what your limitations are. Absolutely. So, well, we still have a good connection. I've got uh, our Mississauga class, the grade sevens are wondering about what you're eating up there. What are you eating in the cabin? Um, well, we have brought goods for the nine months and it's some dried goods. Uh, it's, um, it's some, uh, yeah, so it's sort of uh, things that we that last for, for a while. And also we have some some meat and some fish and, um, and and frozen stuff. We have some powder. So we have quite quite okay food, actually. And, and I think that we might have a helicopter coming before Christmas. So maybe we'll have some fresh vegetables before Christmas. That would be fantastic. Now we haven't seen people in two months. So that would be just... Uh, and that would be the priest, actually, having a, a um, service. Yeah, Christmas service for us. Yeah, so that's... And that's part about today. We share this in Cambridge Bay and uh, you know, BC, and maybe I missed the school. We have a good one, Bernard. So we're, you know, we're just eating, uh, and hopefully it just doesn't run out because that would be that would be bad. Uh, all right. Yeah, no grocery stores anywhere nearby to resupply. That would be challenging. Very cool. All right, Mrs. Gill's class, I'm going to turn your mic on uh, one more time and see if you guys have another question for Eric uh, or uh, Hilda and Cinnaba at uh, the Yeah, but you've already asked her. Do you want to ask her? Let's see. Okay. You can ask that. All right, here comes someone. How many photos did the drone need to take to create the model? Excellent question. Thank you for that. Um, it really depends on the size of the area. The one that I showed you was about 180 photos uh, that the drone took. Uh, sometimes I take only 20 or 30, sometimes 1,000. Okay, Eric, can you just repeat that one more time? We had the, they went out on us with that static right, right while you were answering. Yeah, sure, no problem. So uh, the one that I showed you, the model that I showed you was about 180 photos, uh, overlapping photos. Uh, sometimes you can take as little as 20. Uh, sometimes I take uh, a thousand photos or more, just depending on the size of the area that I want to create the model of. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we've 
temporarily lost Hilda and Cineva. Um, hopefully we can get them in one more time. We're getting near the end of the call. So we definitely want to give them a big shout out uh, before we wrap up for today. But I'm going to go to Mrs. Franz's group. If you guys have another question for Eric about drones in the Arctic and that technology as well, Mrs. Holloway's group, if you want to send um, a message into the chat, if you have another question about the drone. So uh, Mrs. Franz, your microphone is on. What type of drone did they use up there? Did they use up there? Love these questions. Yeah, so they, they used uh, a drone called a DJI Mavic 2 Enterprise. And so it's, it's, a, it's a commercial type drone um, that was provided by a company called Indro Robotics. And they're here on the West Coast on Salt Spring Island and they donated the drone. And it has, it's got the color camera and the thermal on it. So it's very special for search and rescue type of work, but also it's great for research. All right, perfect. Uh, and Hilda and Cinema, I can see that you're back with us. Um, we're just gonna do one quick lightning round of questions and then we're gonna wrap things up uh, for today. So we just had a question from uh, Mrs. Franz's group. So Mrs. Gill's group, do you guys have one more question for uh, Hilda and Cinema or Eric before we wrap up today? Of already answered it was really talking about um, living their experience living there for so long but they've really touched on that already um, so if you want to talk to another class we would understand all right perfect if you guys do have one you're welcome because we do have a couple minutes i think i see someone at the back with their hand up do you have a question tessa okay come on up so this one's for hildy and Sineva. so my question is, do you guys think that it's going to be hard to adjust back to normal life once you're back? Ooh, good question. Whoa, that was, that was, that was like, that was the best question. Um, we were just talking about this very thing yesterday and the answer is yes. Um, you know, I, when I went to the South Pole, that was the longest trip I've ever done and it was 73 days, and I came back, and I, um, for three and a half months, I, I walked around in a, in a bit of a daze, and it was, I, you know, it's a little depressing, actually, You'd become a little depressed, because, especially, like, up here, our whole, our whole existence, our entire life up here is, is about survival, and it's also our commitment to collecting the data for this the research we've committed to, and it's also connecting with all of you um, school kids, and really appreciate you being on the call. Um, and so those three priorities for us are our focus. Like, that's what we do every day. Um, and so to come back home and be in a world that, where we have a lot of lights and we have a lot of noise and we have a lot of just a lot of stuff, um, it's going to be really overwhelming, and we're – we're not really sure how we'll handle that. So we've talked about um, getting somebody in uh, into our communication maybe a few months before we leave here to talk about how slowly to prepare ourselves because it's going to be a bit of a it's going to be a quite a shock. And it's extremely different the life we are living just now uh, compared to the life we are living back home. So it's a very very good question, and and we don't have a very good answer, but. We will definitely adjust. I mean, the, the, the life we'll live back home is, is the normal life. So this is a sort of a big, big adventure for us, and we, we love it. But it's um, on the edge. It's really, it's, uh, it could really be dangerous any second by going outside um, for both the weather and the wildlife outside here. So it's something we are so much more um, maybe alive uh, and present um, so yeah, it's going to be a huge uh, thing to come back. But but of course, we we will love to see our family and uh, to meet Eric on the boat again. And uh, yeah, no, it's it's going to be great coming back. But it's going to be a huge different lifestyle coming back. All right, and then we're going to squeeze in one more question from Mrs. Franz's group. Do you guys have one more question? Give me a wave if I should turn your mic on again. I think I see someone just jumped up, so I'm going to turn that mic on. 
Um, this one's for Eric. How long does it take to make a drone and how much does it cost? <laughs> <laughs> oh, these are tough questions, guys. Um, well, I don't make drones. Um, I just buy them. Uh, but I do have some students here at BCIT that do make drones. And it took them about about eight months to actually d design and build their own drone. And you could do this for about, depending on the size of the drone, you could do this for about a about, thousand uh, to $2,000 for a, a do-it-yourself type of drone. Good question. All right, very cool. Well, we are right at the point where we usually start to wrap up uh, our events. And that big static hiss that you just heard was us losing uh, Hilden Cinema. So fingers crossed that we get them in one more time. We can do a big goodbye and thank you. Uh, and we'll let them get back to their stormy night. Although I guess it's pretty much stormy night almost all day uh, long for them right now. So they're enjoying some of that action. And here they are. Uh, Hilda and Sinova, can you hear yes. us? All right, perfect. Well, we're Absolutely. just where we're going to wrap the event up today. So if you have a final word for the classrooms, then we'll sign things off. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining the call today. Um, we hope this is, I mean, super interesting for me at all to, to listen to Eric um, and the research he's you know, doing what we're doing, doing about what's happening around the world as it relates to climate change. And we're just two people, but we're, we're growing um, in numbers thanks to all of you joining the phone call. So don't forget to stay curious and stay engaged and get outside and uh, keep asking the good questions. All right, perfect. Well, a huge thank you to our classrooms on YouTube. Obviously, a huge thank you to the classrooms joining us via camera today. Thank you so much, uh, Eric, for joining us today and spending some time showing us the really cool tech you're using and the innovative research. Uh, so important in our changing planet right now, no question. Yeah, fantastic and to be here. Thanks for the opportunity, guys. Stay warm, stay curious, and keep asking those awesome questions. Thank you so much. Perfect. Hilda Sinova, as always, thank you so much. You stay warm. Uh, out there. I look forward to hearing how your Christmas goes. Uh, happy holidays. Let's turn the microphones on, boys and girls. If you want to get nice and loud, a big goodbye and thank you uh, before we sign off for today. All the microphones are on. <laughs> right. Awesome job. Thanks so much, Eric. Thanks so much, Hilda and Sinova. Uh, we look forward to another connection next week. Thanks, everyone. Take care, Hilda and Cinema. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, and Mark. And Mark. Hey, thanks, Aaron. Thank you.